the Music for Heart podcast, 30, episode 32. Did I do that right, Chris? You got it right, man. 32. <laughs> Music for podcast. 32. I know. We were a mature age podcast now at age 32. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, Chris. Yes. Um, you got the same background going on there. No, oh, um, don't get me started, Dan. You haven't moved house yet, have you? Long, long story, but in a nutshell, obviously people have been watching this um, podcast for a few weeks. You know I've been moving and packing, and last Friday was moving day, and we've got the keys to the house, and when we walked into the house, it wasn't prepared for us. It was dirty, unclean, things were broken. Everything with the house, they had two weeks to get it ready, and they said that they had it bond cleaned. The agents didn't go in and check it, and the place was an absolute pigsty. Um, they still had things in the backyard from their children. They had the shed full of things. They had uh, um, drain flies in every drain hanging around. Oh, um, no. The whole place was just disgraceful. They and, did a runner, didn't they? Pardon? They did a runner, and then... Well, they're the owners. The owners moved out. So I'm not sure how that works, but the owners moved out and um, <laughs> they didn't do a run because it's their house. But unfortunately, no one went to the house until we looked in it and we took 140 photos of the property of things we didn't oh. like. And we took a walkthrough video and sent it off to the right people, RTA and to the real estate agents. And we basically, on the spot, said we're not moving in and we're cancelling everything and we haven't got a place to live. Luckily, no, we no, I know. Us. Luckily, we just took our property off the listing of rental, which is back here, obviously, um, haven't moved out, but this Ooh. is going to be rented. So it's it'll down the track it will be. But we're back to, back to searching for a new place. Well, on this, I know it's got nothing to do with music or anything like that, but I just wanted to let it be a lesson to people. Still. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and always be careful. No, one thing I've learned, the biggest thing I've learned from this is yes. when you pack boxes, don't just write kitchen on them or whatever it is, because we have nine or so boxes of kitchen. And when you stay in the house that you're in and need things out those boxes, it's a lot easier kind of like categorizing a little bit more of what's in them. Because now we're opening boxes again. It's taking a while to find a whisk or a toaster. Or things like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Write a bit more so, detail so, than just kitchen. Oh, <laughs> oh lesson learned, man. Lesson been learned. A, been a horrible, right. horrible couple of week, uh, weekend, to be honest. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Well, let, 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 let's, let's, let's talk about some music, shall we? Shall we? Let's yes, we about... shall. So, yeah. Then I want... Well, um, last week we, we sort of talked about um, the Kirk Hammett solo EP. Yeah, Portals. I hadn't heard it, and um, I said, look, I think there was two that I said I needed to listen to before we sort of went into a bit of a deep dive on them, mm -hmm. and yep. uh, I did, I had to listen to Portals, and geez, I liked it. Yeah? Gee, uh, yeah, I mean, I like instrumental albums and things like that, and I think, uh, yeah, Portals is really good. I think it's got that really nice cinematic quality mm -hmm. to it that Metallica could do very well, and... Kirk was clearly looking for that as, as an option for his um, for for his music. Yep. There's only four tracks on it, yep. um, but yeah, really, really cool. I really dug it. I could see why you said you were listening to it while packing because it's it's something that you can you can have on. I was working when I was listening to it. And it was really good to have on in the background whilst yeah. I was working. It's, it's 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 a cool record. I, I really dug it. Um, it's amazing though. After all these years, he's only brought out a Four track EP. Yeah. Maybe it was, that's all James it was said. written for a purpose, though. It was written to be the background music, I believe, when you walk through the Museum of Horror that he has. Mm, that's exactly so, right. Yes, he's, he's created a Museum of Horror. Yeah. So when you walk through, there's better mm. sound effects in the background. So I'm guessing, um, uh, probably too, he might have been a little bit worried about asking the guys in Metallica if he could do this because we all know what happened with Jason. Um, mm. And they were happy, but everyone's grown up now. It's now twenty years on, so um, they've obviously matured and don't. Well, you hope they've grown up. <laughs> so, you, yeah, you they, they realise now. They realise now that nothing's going to affect Metallica as a monster it is. Mm. So, um, 
I hope he brings out more now. And I do hope that um, the longer, you know, not just EPs, but some more solo stuff. Because I actually really liked it. I thought it was great listening to it, mm. like I said. And now it's really good to know that you you think the same kind of thought as, as me, as in background mm. music. It kind of follows from beginning to end all the way quite easily through. Um, mm-hmm. Really, really good. I was really, really enjoyed it. And I didn't expect it, but I did love it in the end more than I expected to. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, I really did. I, I, um, I, I will listen to it again. Um, yeah, can't wait to listen to it again. Actually, when I get back and, and get into some work, I'll, I'll put it on in the background again because, yeah. as I said, I, I do like instrumental music, and I think um, Portals, it sounded really great and it was well recorded, well produced. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really good. I really, really dug it. I, I thought really, really good. I'm glad he got permission to make it. Uh, <laughs> the permission, well, the blessing, <laughs> the blessing to make it. I mean, you know, you, you ought to do something. I'm surprised it's taken him this long. But as we, as you said before, we all know what happened when Jason wanted to go do something. Yeah. Besides Metallica, he kind of got the, what are you doing? Isn't Metallica enough? Yeah. You know, what do you mean? You want to get your musical rocks off? Doing what? That. Okay, you know, what that for? What if that becomes more successful than Metallica? What are you going to do then? Yeah. You know? You know but yeah. So, you know, I think they yeah, look, I've got no problem with that at all. You know, if, if they want to do, if he wants to do something like that, then, yeah, let him go. Let him do it. And he's clearly very good. So, yeah. And uh, the other one that um, to listen to was Daniel Johns' new album, Future mm. Never. And yeah, you I, I actually, Yeah, I did. I really dug it. It's very eclectic. I will tell, tell you now, it's very eclectic. Yep. He, it's like, it's like listening to the radio now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Listening to the, yeah, that's what I felt. Listening to it, it was like listening to um, a hit station because there's so many things going on on that record. Like, the guy clearly loves pop music, probably yep. a bit more than rock, where he started out. Like, he started out as a kid who loved Sabbath and, and all that stuff. But as he grew older, he got into dance music and he liked where dance music and electronic music could go. Yeah. And plus he's, he's got a real pop thing going on there and it's like, he's meshed it all, but sometimes it's like listening to the radio. It's like one song sounds like one thing and the next song sounds like yeah, yeah. I can another that, thing. And then the, yeah. And I thought that and at the time I thought, Oh, it's all right. But then after I went, but this is what's going on in this guy's brain. Mm. And this guy's brain has just, it's just got ideas going through it all yeah. the time. And yep. um, yeah, I actually really dug the record. I was listening to by the end of it, I was like, this is actually a really, really cool record. I, I really dug it a lot. Um, and for an Australian release, I don't know if he's going to sell lots. He's, he's not going to tour it. I mean, that's no. a big thing with him. He's not going to play live ever again. Um, look, he, he could, I mean, with the right collaborators, you, you could perform it live. But obviously, he's, he's doing a... Um, a Brian Wilson or a Beatles, so to speak, just sit in the studio, make these records, but he's not making them at any great rate. He's making it at a snail's pace, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just releasing it when he thinks it's right. He, he you know, but oh uh, yeah, you can really, you can really hear this. There's something really good going on there, and, and I, I liked it a lot. So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a good thumbs up. It's a, it's a good eight out of ten record for me. Daniel John's future yeah. never. What did you it's think really- of the cover of Freak? That, that one really jumped out because it's, it's it's called Freak Never. Yeah. And it's he sings it with someone called Purple Girl. Purple Girl. Yeah. You told me is a friend of his daughter. He doesn't name the friend and he doesn't name the daughter. He just calls her. And she's the one who came up with this different version of Freak. Yeah. And so when you're listening to the album and that comes on, you think, oh, I know this. Oh, it's really cool and it's really different. It's slowed down with a piano piece. And yeah, I, I I really got it, and and that one really struck out at me. I mean, there's 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 quite a few songs that really sort of stick out with you. Um, I haven't got the track listing in front of him, me, but um, well, if I did, I'd be a bit more prepared, wouldn't I, <laughs> with the track listing. Uh, but yeah, there's it, it's really kind of cool. Have a listen. Look, it's it, look. I think anyone who goes in expecting Silverchair, yeah, will, always going to be disappointed. You know, you, you can't go into into a Daniel John solo endeavor anymore and expect Silverchair. You're not going to get it. 
Um, young Modern really sort of indicated that he was moving away from the sound of Silverchair, yep. that initial sound. Uh, yep. And I did like that for that reason. I, I thought, um, I still think um, Straight Lines is a, is a great song. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I really do. I, I think that's a great song. Um, you know, he's a talented guy and obviously there's a lot going on in the brain. So yeah, Future Never, it gets a, it's a good thumbs up from me. I really, I did enjoy it. I, I like the yeah. record. I'd actually kind of listen to it again. Yeah, I, I think they started realising back with Diorama that they were going away from what Silverchair were known for. Um, you mm. know, more than just really emphasise the fact that it's going to be different from now on. And I think this is kind of a step. I haven't, I haven't really listened to his other album talk that much, but I have heard it. I think this is even still a, a different step again for Daniel Johns from talk to this one here, um, mm. the future never. But back on what you were saying about the freak never song. Um, so yeah, uh, Daniel Johns is a private person and doesn't have a lot of people visiting his house and a lot of friends and big big circle of friends who he trusts. So no, he one of his no. who he does trust used to come over to his house all the time. And brought his daughter along, who was eleven. And that's what you were saying before. Yeah. That's the girl who's called Purple Girl, and no one knows who it is. And Daniel Johns been very, very careful because um, Daniel Johns obviously has gone through childhood um, stardom, just like a lot of people did in the states, like Britney Spears and Lindsay Lohan and those people, Macaulay Culkin. So he's keeping this girl's name private and who she is. But she sat at the table at the piano with him one day and started seeing Freak with him. But differently, and she he really liked it. So that's what apparently is on the recording is her, an eleven year old girl, mm. singing this song the way that she sang it to Daniel, and he really liked it. So um, interesting uh, to do that. But I, I think it's amazing. I think it sounds so good. So, but yeah, I'm mm. really glad you like the album as well because both those albums, Portals and Future Never, have taken me on a bit of a diversion of what I'm listening to in the in the, in the um, CD player, I guess you can say, or on, on streaming at the moment. You know. Um, mm. Taking me different different directions, so a bit more rush now. I'm listening to a bit more rush now as well, um, and a bit more. Oh yeah. Stuff. So, um, and I still have to listen to the Frank Zappa one you told me to listen to as well, which would be different. Uh, yeah, I, was, I was thinking of that because yeah, yeah, Frank Frank Zappa. I told you to listen to Apostrophe. Apostrophe. Uh, yeah. It's probably two albums, Apostrophe and Overnight Sensation. He recorded them at the same time, right. um, and then even Dweezil said they're the two Frank Zappa albums to get into. Yeah, if you're a new, I'm. I got to admit, my first foray into Frank Zappa, well, it was, and we've gone from Daniel Johns to Frank Zappa very quickly. Um, it was, was always genius. Steve Vai, you know. It was it was always the Steve Vai thing that wanted me get me into it. So the first album I listened to was one um, that Steve Vai played on called "Ship Arriving Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch," and it had Valley Girl on it, which was a song I'd heard, which was sort of a big single for him. A big, his only really big hit. Um, and it was an okay record, it was, but it introduced me to the weirdness of Zappa. And yep. I kind of went, well, this is weird. Um, it's not David Lee Roth's Eat and Smile or Skyscraper, so it's a bit of different for me from what I'm used to with Vi. Of course, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I, I see it the opposite way around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With, uh, with, with Steve Vi, and I, I sort of look back on his more um, eclectic stuff that he did with Zappa and, and some of the stuff he does solo. But... Um, it was many years later I got back into it when um, this, this compilation album came out called Strictly Commercial, which was kind of like a, a best of. Mm -hmm. And it kind of had all the really cool songs from his albums, like the weird and the, and the quirky. And some of them really stood out for me. Like there's a song called San Bedino, which I, I will wait as my favorite Zappa track. Um, and that hooked me. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and plus I was, Triple J, when I was listening to them, used to play a fair bit of Zappa on there. And I had heard some of the things like, you know, Billy the Mountain and um, Willie the Pimp and, and a few other, um, Peaches and Regalia, the great in instrumental track that opens the best of. So, yeah, you know, the, the, but I think if another way to get into it is the classic album series. Um, yeah. There's one on Zappa, which is the two, Apostrophe, and they do the two albums because, as I said, they were recorded together. They came out one after the other. So you could almost classify it as a single album. And Zappa would do that. Zappa did that throughout his whole career deliberately. The, he called it um, con 
continu- well, continuity, something continuity, where it was like you could listen to one Frank Zappa song or you could listen to a whole album, but you listen to them from start to finish. But if you listen to Zappa's entire discography from the first album, Freak Out, right through to his last album, you will hear musical motifs throughout every one that can make the whole of Zappa's recording con- yeah, conceptual continuity. That's what he called it. It will make it sound like the whole thing is one piece of music. His wow. entire catalogue is one piece of music. That's a long and, song. Yeah, which is very much a composer's way of thinking. I, I yeah. feel that sometimes listening to Nine Inch Nails, so I'm, I'm wondering if um, Trent Reznor is doing that as well. Oh, yeah. This yep. conceptual continuity. There's musical motifs all through his albums. That, that continue. I remember hearing that on that record. I remember hearing, and that Zappa always, always did that. Yep. Um, but so that's a good way to get into Zappa is watch that doco. Uh, but I saw um, there was a thing that Rick Beato did on his um, oh, yeah. on his channel the other day. Did you see the weirdest guitar solos? Weirdest guitar solos, yeah. Did you watch that one? Yeah, yeah. Frank Zappa was number one. Yeah, I'm um, five five five, and I thought yeah, yeah. that's the album I should be getting Chris into. Shut up and play your guitar. It's all guitar <laughs> solos and stuff like that, and that's the one I thought when I was watching. I thought, oh, I shouldn't told Chris that one. That's what I mean. You can't. Wh- which one do I pick? Yeah, which yeah. one do I pick? But I thought, yeah, you like your guitar playing. Um, shut up and play your guitar. It's all guitar solos. And when he when um Beato was playing that one five five five, and I was like listening to it and watching it, and I'm thinking. <sighs> Oh boy, that's yeah, that's some Weird. pretty good playing on that <laughs> song, and you know, in the timing, the time signatures, and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. You're like, geez, Zappa, he's you know, <laughs> he's doing. And you can see Vi gets a lot of when Vi's really good, he's on that. But you can hear where he, he really sat at the foot of Frank and and went, "What do I do here?" And because you know the story, it was I think the first thing Zappa got Vi to do was transcribing. That was what he had to do, transcribe all the musical parts for all the band to play. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a teaching thing. Yeah, yeah. That's a learning thing like you would never believe, you know. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah, it, it, and Zappa was about work. It wasn't about, oh, you know, there was no, there might have been sex, but there was no drugs in, in Zappa. It was, it was all, it was work. Yeah. He paid his band to work. So if they weren't playing, they were rehearsing. You know, there was no days off. You know, if you if you called in sick, you had to bring a doctor's certificate, oh, all wow. that sort of stuff. Yeah, he treated it like a job. Yeah, he, fair he, enough. Zappa treated it like a job. You know, he said, "I'm not here to make friends. It's the music business, and I'm here. It's a business, and I'm trying to keep this business rolling." So yeah, yeah, so, yeah he treated it like a business. Um, just quickly. Mm. Um, quickly, that was good. Yeah, that was quick, wasn't it? morning. <laughs> Don't know how that happened, but um, uh, Mick Mars. The news about him recently. He's oh. meant to be releasing a very versatile and heavy album, solo album at the end of the year. Now he has been working on this solo album for since. years. Yes, this when the dirt came out, he said, yeah. "I'm working on a solo record," and that came out in two thousand and one. So that's 22, and he's probably been working on it since before the yeah. dirt came out. Yeah, it was just coming out of the news again today, uh, yesterday actually, so I saw that, I thought I'd mention Oh, that. okay. And we have discussed before the whole Motley Crue, Def Leppard tour they're doing, and how you kept saying, who's going to headline? Because theoretically, mm. Def Leppard should, but Motley mm. Crue are probably the bigger name, well, were currently. But again, I've just read the other day from Def Leppard, their um, article, and they said they're actually going to be rotating headline spots. So that answers yep, the sorry. question. Um, yes, I heard that. Yes. One of the specification on that. Yep. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there was like, it was like um, years ago, I went and saw um, Queens of the Stone Age and Nine Inch Nails doing a show. Yep. And the whole purpose of the tour was um, it was a co headlining tour. What they would do is before the first band went on stage, they would flip a coin. Oh. That's how they did it. They flipped the coin and whoever um, won went on last. Right. So the night I went, 
I went with a friend of mine and um, we saw and Nine Inch Nails were starting. And I'm like, oh, clearly Nine Inch Nails lost the toss tonight and they were on first. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they were both so different, but that was the way they did it. And obviously, um, that's what Def Leppard and Motley Crue are going to do, which I think is good. It, you don't step on egos. And I, I think it's all business decisions, but you, as I've said plenty of times, Def Leppard sold way more records than Motley Crue did. Yeah. You know, Motley yeah. Crue, yes, put on a very spectacular show. That's great. But as far as mass appeal is concerned, Def Leppard are the one. Yeah, Hysteria sold mm. <laughs> nearly 40 million records. You know, that's just one record alone. They're, they're the bigger band as far as record sales are concerned. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. um, a few nominations are coming out for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Fan yeah. nominations. And Judas yeah, Bruce well, and Rage Against the Machine did not get in. The top well, at, so far, this is the fan vote. The fan yeah, vote's fan in vote. at the moment. And it came down to number one by, by an Absolutely. Well, I, I said it to you, but now I've absolutely forgotten what it was. What was number one? I said it to you. Uh, oh, it was man. a huge margin. Yeah, yeah, that'd be right. I, I'm going to have to look this up whilst we're on air. But I remember um, Eminem came in second and Pat Benatar third. And yeah, I, I do have it all on my all on my uh Nice little computer here in front of me, and I'm going to look at it whilst I'm talking to you, Chris, because I did. I wrote it down. Listen to me. <laughs> My goodness. Here we go. Final. Here it is. Here it is. And it was a huge margin, too. It was like, and, and um, the, the top three get through. Yep. Towards, but this thing goes to the, um, the actual final vote of the the board of, of rock and roll hall of fame so to speak that, that's where the, this where this vote goes to and yeah. duran duran they were the number one oh, duran yeah. duran were number one yeah. that's it because i remember it was the, the fans really got behind it you could see the it was a real they really networked hard the duran duran fans and right. they're still bringing out music and they're still they're still playing live and they're still pretty damn good Mm. You know, I, I remember um, years ago when I was working at the record store and one of the new Duran Duran albums came out, sold really well. Yeah. I was surprised at how people were coming in and buying it. So they've obviously got that core, that, that core fan base that still like them. They're still bringing out really good music. And if you listen to the old Duran Duran music, I remember at the time it was just Mrs. Pretty Boy Pop or whatever. But actually really listen to those songs. They're great. Yeah. They were, they were a really, really, really good band. So, look, i got no problem with Duran Duran coming in, you know, getting that number one spot, which probably more or less guarantees them to be in. Uh, Eminem getting second. I was surprised at how Duran Duran and how many votes Duran Duran beat Eminem by. That's oh, really? what. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a big match between first and second. Uh, Pat Benatar came in third. third yep. um, she should, you know, this, this is rock and roll all of fame, you know. Really? She's won Grammys and stuff, and Oh, she's still not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know what I mean? Yeah. All things being equal, you know, it, it, it should have to come to things like this. But apparently Dolly Parton, because mm. she with even though she withdrew, she didn't withdraw from the fan vote. She came in fifth. Uh, Eurythmics came in fourth. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm surprised the Eurythmics... I mean, yeah, I've got it in front of me. Here we go. Duran Duran, 934,880 votes. Wow. Eminem, 684, 237. That's, and then Pat Benatar, 632, 631, 299. So that goes to show you how the Duran Duran fans really got themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good um, on them. Hey? Good on them. What's that? Good on them. Yeah, good on them. But Judas Priest came in sixth. And um, just means that Priest... Pre priest are uh, going to be a while before they sort of get in there, which I think is really bad. So they're missing a spot on the ballot by nearly 30,000 votes. But yeah, Dolly Parton is still in with a chance. But yeah, the 
the fan vote, Duran Duran, I think, are going to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was surprised. That, where did um, Rage Against come? Rage Against Machine. I think they got seventh. See, that surprises me because aren't, yeah. aren't they already in there? Aren't Rage Against the Machine already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? No, they're not. Devo, yeah, look at this. Yeah, Devo, the MC5, the New York Dolls. They're still so Lionel many. Rich- yeah, that, that's just that's. I don't get it. I, I don't get it, man. No, me I, 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 re- I really don't get it. You know, like yeah, I, I say yay, Duran Duran, yay, Pat Benatar, yay, Eminem. Um, but the dolls aren't there. Rage Against the Machine, Devo. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe the MC Five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are not in the rock. I mean, geez, I can go on about about this. All right, we had a bit of a technical glitch there, but I'm back. But we were talking about the Rock Hall of Fame, and yep. you see why I'm losing my hair. Chris is losing his hair for different reasons. I'm losing my hair. This Rock Hall of Fame, it just like I'll, we've had, we've had plenty of discussions about this. I don't like it, but I like to see the acknowledgement of particular artists. But when I see, I could go on, Chris, and clearly I was going on a bit, wasn't I? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, it's all that's all good. It's all good. Let's 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 get rid of it. Let's just cleanse ourselves of this and you know all that sort of stuff. I can't do it anymore. Right. It's just gonna a heartache. Um look, let's go to cool thing, Chris. Let's go to something nice. Let's go to cool thing. You have a cool thing for the week? I do have a cool thing for the week. Um it's been said before I do like Van Halen, but I just noticed the other day. What? Van Halen? Yeah, have you heard of him? Oh. Uh, yeah, they're a band from um, California. Yeah. Weird, though, naming yourself, naming your band after yourself. But anyway, well, Bon Jovi did the same thing. Um, yeah, true. Anyway, thirty-three years ago, they released an album called OU812, and it was one of my favorite albums of theirs. But most of their albums are my favorite, so I can't really put it in a category. But yeah, thirty-three oh. years ago, that album came out. It's still one of the best um, albums of theirs. I think I love listening to it. But yeah. Have a listen to that one because it is really good. It's got some really good stuff on it. Um, but, yeah, can't believe it's 33 years when I was in high school listening to that song, that uh, album. Um, but, yeah, no more Van Halen as we speak, I guess. But, yeah, go back and listen to the, the great songs of Van Halen. Did, uh, cool did, you know, did you know, before I go to my cool thing, that that album title was a dig at David Lee Roth? Yeah, because of... Um, uh, what was it? Edom and Smile. Edom and Smile flopped. Yeah, and yeah, yeah so they came out with OU812. So yeah, yeah there you go. So OU812. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, OU812. <laughs> yeah. And what's your well, cool my, thing, buddy? My cool thing. It's a brand new TV show that started called We Own the City. We own this city. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, on binge. It's created by David Simon. Um, who did The Wire, which is one of the greatest cop television shows ever. So this is his brand new one about corrupt cops in the in Baltimore. And already the first episode is a bit of a wow. Really? Um, yeah, John Bernthal's in it. Uh, lots going on, lots of characters. They're establishing a lot of corruption, a lot about racism and the way the police force handles things, uh, knowing David Simon. It will be really expertly handled. Yep. Uh, and, yes, I, yeah, I've yeah, i only watched one episode. It's one episode old. Uh, but, yeah, really, really cool beginning. I'm looking forward to it. We own this city. That is my cool thing for this week. Fair enough. Thank you. That's great. Oh, thank you, indeed. Yes, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank I'm going to point, point down because at the bottom of the screen, you say like, subscribe, yep. and... Um, you ring the bell for notifications. Yeah, yeah. So sure. you know when it comes, yeah, you can go. Oh. To Pete Walker again, thank you very much for spreading the word for us. He's now trying mm-hmm. to get us to fifty subscribers. He even suggested a hundred. So thank you for being behind us hundred percent, like you are. And yeah, mm. you can subscribe. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't mean you're going to get inundated with heaps of ads or anything. Just it helps us out get to a nice figure of a hundred. And uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, the more we get the better chance we get better guests on. Um, we've already had one, which was Corey, but we want to get more and more. So, yeah, the more yes. subscribers, the more the higher the guests in, internationally would recon- recognise us, and then they'll go, yeah, we'll go on your show. So we'll be better, uh, bring you better content and better guests 
down the track. So, yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a good week. See you later, everyone. Bye.